what interested me so much, and it was actually something I took as a life lesson, is how calm you were at the time of what I thought was to be uncertainty. I learned that even under the most difficult circumstances for one of the hardest jobs in the world, you can keep a cool head if you don't panic. You made me relive the moment. Sometimes um, uh, you, you think you know, the doctor is not nervous. The doctor is thinking about 10, 15 things and thinking about five steps ahead with time. You tend to get more comfortable with being nervous and you know that uh, you have to keep following the steps. Doctor, a common misunderstanding that you see in your line of work. What comes to mind is that people think that doctors can control outcomes. Can you recall a situation where you were extremely nervous while in the operating room? Dr. Raid Sayed, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, before, I mean, I, I take it any further, I want to thank you for one of the best gifts I've ever gotten in my life in delivering my twins uh, just over two months ago. I There's not much more I can say than just thank you so much for everything you have done and, and, and in making the experience so easy and pleasurable for us. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and it was a pleasure taking care of you and your family. And uh, yeah, we were lucky. We were. Yeah, we were. Uh, so it's for you, it's just another day in the office. For us, it's like the day is finally here. What interested me so much, and it was actually something I took as a life lesson, is that irrespective of, of how much you plan for and, you know, we were doing tests every other day. And but the, when the day came and, and you know, the, the, the operation happened, as f from, from my perspective, for you, it might have been nothing. But from my perspective, there w w something went not according to plan. And all I could do at the time was look at you. One of the babies weren't breathing. My hand started tingling. I was fighting off a panic attack. All I could do was look at you. What I will never forget, doctor, is how calm you were at the time of what I thought was to be uncertainty. Steady hand, nothing will rattle you until eventually he did start breathing. It was two or three minutes, but those two or three minutes felt like two or three years for me. So I, I, I learned that even under the most difficult circumstances for one of the hardest jobs in the world, you can keep a cool head if you don't panic. So thank you. That's true. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I wanted to get that story out before we start anything because you might have forgotten about it because you probably delivered 100 babies since, but I will never forget about that. You made me relive the moment. I, I, I tend to remember all the deliveries I had, especially the ones that are um, memorable. Uh, some, sometimes um, uh, you, you think... You know, the doctor is not nervous. The doctor is thinking about 10, 15 things and thinking about five steps ahead in each case. Um, but with time, you tend to get more comfortable with being nervous. And you know that uh, you have to keep following the steps. You can't stop. You have to keep following the steps, Ashan. If you don't, you something can go wrong. So, yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, I have chills now from <laughs> from the memory. Well, I will, uh, I will, I will, I will close this segment of uh, of at least a story that I wanted to share with you in saying that when uh, when we asked you how are things going, you know, some people can use too much humor in times when it's just, and you can use none in times when you need. But you use the perfect amount when my wife asked you. How is it going, doctor? We were we were airborne at this time. We were halfway through. The babies were about to come out. And you said, well, I'm following the manual. So, so far, things are looking good. I managed to get some sensation back in my hands because that is the exact amount of humor that I needed in my life at that point. And she giggled, by the way. So, again, just thank you. Thank you for uh, knowing exactly how much to give of what at, at any given time, doctor. That's welcome.
how far along in in your career, uh, you know, studying career, um, or when you entered the field of medicine, did you know that delivering babies or OBGYN is something that you wanted to call your career one day? Um, uh, I I graduated uh, medical school, uh, top ten in my class, and I was looking for a job, and uh, I was specifically looking to be. Uh, um, an academic more than just being just a, an MD. I wanted to be an academic and work for a university and then, pers- you know, pursue my career as an academic. So um, imagine I was looking into plastic surgery and that was not available. Uh, I asked for um, ophthalmology. I don't know why I asked for ophthalmology, honestly. And that was not available, thank God. And uh, the, the guy said, uh, what do you think of uh, being an OBGYN? On the phone, what do you think of being an OBGYN? I said, I don't know. I, I like the subject. Um, I did good in OBGYN in school. And uh, I, I can see myself doing OBGYN. Um, and my wife was there, she's like, Really? You want to do what we should want? I said, yeah, I think so. I like it. And in 1999, I got hired. Uh, two years later, I go to Canada, come back, and I'm an OBGYN. <laughs> so, I don't think you know that story. Do you know that story? Yeah, even my kids don't know that story. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, the doctor's uh, middle child, I think it was the second yeah. son you mentioned. Armor. So you, you, you finished med school over there did you end up ever practicing uh over there yeah um i did uh five years of residency uh and that's how you get to be an OBGYN. And then i did a fellowship uh and uh, a master's degree so the fellowship was in urogynecology when you deal with um, uh, surgeries uh, of the pelvic floor trying to fix um, um, some complications of um, after giving birth, complications with of age, and uh, it. Then I did uh, a master's degree. During the master's degree, I had time, and um, the university asked me to, over there, asked me to work in the urogynecology department on staff, while I was uh, doing my master's. So, I did work for a few years until I finished my master's and. Um, and the master's was, was in um, medical education. Um, finished my master's and I uh, got back. Mm-hmm. And now it's been 23 years you're uh, involved in this field of, in Saudi? 99, to, yeah, to two, 2023. 24. 24. Mashallah. Does it, has it felt like 24 years? No. It goes by quick, huh? It went by so fast. Yeah. It's amazing how time goes by <laughs> it's crazy. when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's really... You know, you're doing the right thing when when work doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work until you're exhausted and you're beat. And you just can't get another call. Mm. So, yeah, it's uh, it doesn't feel like work most days. One thing I picked up on you on our third or fourth visit with you, which I liked, which I feel people don't do it enough in any field, is not overscheduling your day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people complain about that. Like, why don't you work on weekends? Because I want to work on weekends. Why don't you work at night? Because like, I don't want to work at night. Um, I'm only there, yeah, between 1 and 3, on 1 and 3.30. Two, three hours a day? Yeah. I think that's very rare. I know, but at a certain point in your life, you tend to choose quality over quantity. So two, three years ago, I decided, you know what? Um, I want to be able to go to work and be happy to see patients. And uh, because I'm busy in the morning and sometimes at night, um, I feel that this is the perfect uh, quantity for me at this point in my life. Like an equilibrium. Yeah. If people can find out how much work they need to do per day to be the best version of themselves, it's way better than cramming as many hours as you can in one day until you reach the point of exhaustion. What good are you when you're exhausted? That's how errors can potentially happen. That's true. But if you look at uh, being so proficient at doing something, 
you know, that 10,000 hour yeah, rule. Yeah. So uh, you need to put in the hours to be able to to say that you're good at something. If you don't put in the hours, if you say, well, at the beginning of your career, you're like, I'm not going to work so hard. You're not going to get anywhere. So how do you, did you put in more hours in the beginning? And, oh, yeah. And now you, you earned it. You ask, earned your stripes. Ask this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you probably didn't see your father in the, in the first decade or so. Up until 2010, 2012, your father was probably always in the clinic. <laughs> His office had a bed in it. My God, doctor. Yeah, yeah. So you have to you have to put in the, the time mm-hmm. and the effort and the um, the energy um, to get something good, and then at that point you can say, you know what, I can I can get by working two three hours a day, five days a week. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I think works for me now. Yeah. So good to recognize that. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Otherwise, you burn yourself out. Do you have it like a, an age or X amount of years that, that you have in the back of your mind as to how much longer you want to be doing this for? Or did you not land on that? Yeah, I always say a number and people say, no, you're crazy. I say 55 and you're like, they're like, that's so many, no, not so many years away. It's not far away from, from now. But that's what I thought I should be working. And after 55 or around that age, yeah. I shouldn't be working so hard. Just because the you know it's physically demanding, this job, and you want to be at your you know best, your A game. You have to bring your A game every time you go. Uh, so, I think 55, 60 max. Inshallah, I don't know. Allah yatina tulat al umr wal sahha wal afiyah, and uh, be able to do this, yani, properly, uh, for as long as I can without having to having to work. Would you say it's more physically or mentally demanding? Both. Both. Uh, the physical is is enormous. Be If you have to stand or to operate for many hours, uh, you get the chronic neck pain, you get the chronic back pain. Um, uh, you know, you uh, it physically demanding. And then the mental is the worst. That's, that's the, the 24 hour. You 24 uh, seven mentally challenging. Um, I'm talking to you now, and I'm thinking about a patient that's in the oper- uh, not the operating room, sorry, in the emergency room right now, with with something in her related to the pregnancy, but she's not from the pregnancy. So I'm thinking about it, and uh, I'm expecting a call. So this is my life. I expect a call, or I expect a patient to go into labor, or I expect to go to the hospital. So that's the the easy part of the mental challenge the the other stressful situation is when you have someone who's sick and you have to plan and execute you know at the plan and make sure that all the 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 pieces are fitting um, making sure that the the labs are back on time the the different specialties that you need to to give input are being you know consulted it's and, and preparing things for the patient at the hospital and preparing things. And unfortunately, I do all that myself most of the time because um, I like things to be a, a cer- done a certain way. And uh, I don't I feel if I don't do it myself, it's uh, uh, it's not going to be done. But that's my, you know, my my fault. It's a fault of mine that I have to deal with. You had to on when when you said that sometimes you have to make a decision on 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 the best course of action. You had to make a decision with us, with my wife, whereby the decision revolved around giving birth the next day. Yep. You didn't like how something looked on the charts, and you said, and it was never part of the plan for a, a uh, I might be going to too much details here, but you know, it's uh, it, this happened to me. So I'm, I like sharing real, real things on, on my podcast. You said that it's looking like we're going to have to go for a cesarean and I want to do it tomorrow. I, I, I'm not liking how something is looking. So we want to go in there tomorrow. How much stress does that bring to you in needing to make a decision on behalf of someone else based on a reading that you saw? Um, the, the, the medical aspect of it um, 
is that do you have a certain set of guidelines and rules you have to follow? If 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 you get this, do that. Um, most of the time, uh, it's black and white. Sometimes it's gray. And when it's gray, you have to err on the side of caution. For our situation, it wasn't gray. It was it was black and white. I had to make a decision. It had she had to deliver um, as soon as possible because her life was in danger. Um, we sailed through it. A, a month later, the same situation. We have to deliver, and I took a patient from the office to the op- to the operating room, and we delivered. Same situation, but not twins. Same situation, one baby. She's supposed to be better outcome. She did worse. She ended up in the ICU. She uh, for a few days, and alhamdulillah, she sailed through it. She came out, and she's so grateful and so happy. So, you know that she, I know she had to deliver. The stress I have to go through is trying to convince her that she has to deliver. And my own mind is, what if she says no? And how am I going to deal with that? And if something goes wrong, how can I deal with that? You know, you're just thinking a few steps ahead. And if she says yes, how can I start preparing her for delivery? And how I have to pull all the strings I called different hospitals and uh, um, different. Um, I, I was begging for a bed, and the, because there were no beds that day, so uh, that's stressful. And I was doing that myself on the phone, not at home. I was in a social function somewhere, <laughs> and calling, uh, calling three, four different hospitals, and every hospital rejected me, saying no, we can't accept twins at this stage, and until. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I got uh, a green light from one of the hospitals and it worked out. I was externally to you, uh, I was not stressed, but internally I was I was freaking out. I was do a good job not showing it. But it's it's her life on the line. Mm. Yeah, yani, what what can I do? I guess that's where twenty four years of experience kicks in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you have to pull favors and you know call for favors sometimes. You know, knowing people helps when you've been around so long. Knowing some people help. Uh, it helps that uh, you can get the, your, your patient the best care. We forget that doctors are humans and they have lives and they sleep at 3 a.m. But sometimes, are you a light sleeper? Yeah, very light sleeper. It's probably gotten lighter with time because your mind is working while you're sleeping. That's true. If you call me up, uh, I can't go back to bed. Especially if you say you have a patient in the hospital. Like I'm up all night just thinking about the five step ahead, uh, five moves ahead or five step ahead. And um, I'm always pre-planning and uh, and pre-playing the, the surgery or the delivery in my head, just trying to get to the best outcome I can ever have. You know? How do you structure your vacations if you need to be on call at any time? You can't just pick up and say, you know what, I'm going somewhere for the weekend and I'm coming back. This is something that we get to do, but with you. That's a luxury, yeah. You can't imagine. Um, summer vacations, you can book a year ahead. And when people come in and their due date is around that vacation time, you say, I'm sorry, I won't be around this time. And if you tend, if you're going to deliver during this period of time, Either you can follow with me and I can refer you to someone or I can refer you to someone from now. And people are usually happy with that. Mm. I have people come back two or three years later and say, I wanted to follow with you, but I came and you said, you're going away. And this time I really want to be with you. So there's no hard feelings. Uh, Sometimes you're faced with um, a challenge when you have to go away for the weekend for um, a family thing or something that comes up and you have to go, uh, sometimes that's difficult. And uh, if, um, if you have to go, you have to go. And um, sometimes, yeah, some people will get upset. Doctor, a common misunderstanding that you see in your line of work, as broad as that question is, it's a common misunderstanding. Um, what comes to mind is that people think that doctors can control outcomes 
and uh, I like how one patient taught me something once and he was explaining I was saying something to him and his his wife and um, as much as we plan as you mentioned as much as we plan as much as we uh, we uh, we try to to plan a delivery or plan surgery we always are reacting um, to how things are progressing so we we put a plan and we try to follow it <laughs> and uh, as i said there are guidelines that we follow and uh, these guidelines are updated and we try to follow the latest guidelines but we do tend to react to changes or situations that that happen because out of the blue, something could go wrong anytime. So we react. So the misconception is that uh, we can control. Um, because during labor, this happened, or the baby was not happy, or whatever. So usually, the, one of the biggest misconceptions is that we can control it and we can't. Um, you have to be in peace with that um, people who are in peace with that usually have a good experience people who are really you know um, any strict in their views might have not a good experience huh? because uh, things did not work out the way they thought you should work out it wasn't a you're you're a doctor you're not anything more than that and uh, the other misconception is um, that complications shouldn't happen. And uh, in medicine, unfortunately, complications do happen. And there's a number for every complication. Uh, the occurrence is 1 in 1,000, 1 in 100,000, 1 in a million, or 1 in 10. Um, some people think it's negligence. But honestly, from all these years of experience, I tell you, a lot of things could happen that no one could predict or no one could make sure they don't happen because um, complications do happen. Patients are quick to blame the doctor. Unfortunately, uh, this thing started back in the 2000s uh, when a big hoopla happened about uh, uh, doctors are negligent and doctors and start th that view started to grow. Alhamdulillah, now it's much better. Back in 2010, when I first came back, the first thing they will say is uh, <laughs> to anything that happens. Doctor error. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now people are more educated and they look things up. I tell them, you have this and that, and they look it up. Um, they say, oh, okay, um, I understand. Uh, can you explain to me? How could have we avoided? And you explain to them if if it was avoidable, and if not, ninety nine percent they are okay. But uh, it's a misconception that complications should not happen. عجينة محضرة بشغف قوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا أروع. How often? In a ratio format, how often do things go according to plan and how often are you surprised with something that was unforeseen? Um, now versus when I started my career. <laughs> Actually, yes, please. Yeah, first half and the last half. First half, um, I was dealing with more and more uh, normal cases. <laughs> Second <laughs> half... Cases are starting to come, become more and more complicated. How come? Well, I, I ask myself that question every time. Is it luck or are you, because you have become more known, people are coming to you, so you're getting a, a more random spectrum of the market? It could be that. It could be that. Um, I don't want to call uh, myself well-known. I would call myself a no. I've been around. So uh, people tend to gravitate to someone who's been around for longer and they want their experience with their complicated case 
So uh, we've been seeing very complicated cases in the last few years that the my my gray hairs, as you see, it's not as many as you think. It's almost all gray now. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's getting more and more complicated. So, but it it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you humble. I understand client confidentiality very well. Can you give us a gist of what a complicated case looks like? Is it like a quadruple, triplet? No, that's that's a, a, a normal complication to begin with. Hmm. Triplet pregnancy is a complicated pregnancy. And you've had a few for sure. Yeah. And you get to, um, you. we have in the clinic, we have a team. And the team consists of a high risk specialist, um, an internal medicine specialist. Um, we have a dietitian. We have uh, people who take care of these complicated cases. We take care of them together. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have great outcomes because it's not a one man show. Um, uh, so complicated cases are like things that you are not foreseen, as you mentioned before, things that you can't predict. All of a sudden, a uh, patient's fine, and then all of a sudden, liver enzymes shoot up. It's like, why did it happen? No one knows. Their bo the body is um, reacting to the pregnancy. And that can happen in a, in a day, overnight. Overnight. It's not, that's not so complicated. But you see these weird and wonderful cases. Um, I can't say because any anything that I will say could be attributed to a patient. <laughs> so so yeah, very very complicated things are, and even my our team in the, in the clinic is saying this is kind of weird. Why are we getting these cases? Um, uh, so. Yeah, we, we, we're we getting a lot of stuff that uh, is uh, is causing us to stay up. More than ever. More than ever, yeah. yeah. Thank God you only work three hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> a question that would be of interest to the female viewer. Okay. What are ways you suggest for a woman who is pre who is trying to get pregnant, who is having trouble doing so? Can you think of anything that they can do that will help their chances to get pregnant? Uh, we're going to get more technical here. We'll uh, talk in general. See if you can, <laughs> like the main bullet points. I, 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 I love people to leave with with something that they can apply in their in their lives or, or use as help. And I think that the females who are looking to get pregnant will be watching right now with intent. <laughs> Um, sure. Before, before this part, uh, when a female wants to become pregnant, uh, I usually ask them to come by the clinic and get a checkup. Uh, during that checkup, we um, we discuss. We call it preconception counseling. So, in preconception counseling, we talk to them about um, um, what tests they should do, what. Um, uh, supplements they should be on, what diet they should start, uh, how much they should uh, weight they should lose, and um, like the target BMI that they want to be. And uh, I, I I ask them questions that make them think about, okay, when do you want to have the baby born? Do you want the baby born in the summer? Then you have to try around this time if you want the baby born in the winter. Um, just trying to give them pointers about things that they may not have think, thought about. Uh, we, the most important thing that science proved is a healthy diet mm -hmm. and uh, supplements and smoking cessation. What's that last one? Smoking cessation. Means Stop smoking. St any kind of any kind of smoking. It stops smoking. Uh, be on a healthy diet and um, exercise and take supplements. If you do that, you're improving your chances of a healthy pregnancy in general. But then if they don't get pregnant within the three months that plan we put in, we say, okay, we're going to start now because everything we checked is perfect. You checked all the boxes and let's go for it. Uh, she tries for a few months. Nothing happens. She comes back. She says, well, I didn't have, you know, the outcome that I was looking for. Uh, we could start looking into reasons why she, she didn't get pregnant. So you go further into uh, checking the hormones, uh, doing... Um, 
uh, some some lab uh, sorry some uh, uh, imaging for her tubes and checking the husband's uh, semen making sure that uh, all the the right things are there and if everything is fine you say okay you need to be either on the fast track which is going to um, making the ovaries produce more eggs to improve the chances and that's the fast track with medications or you be on the normal track which is okay you make sure that you you have uh, intercourse during ovulation you have to know when your ovulation is and these are the ways to check your ovulation and if you're ovulating and you have intercourse on ovulation days then you are supposed to have a better chance of conceiving since we didn't find anything wrong with you and uh, usually if they want to go the fast track i refer them to the infertility specialist or fertility specialist to to take them hold their hand during that phase and get them to to where they want to be is, is ivf that's that's that route that's the the end point end point yeah ivf is the end point they they do have a few things they could do before ivf and ivf is pretty much a fail safe not really no huh even no. in ivf it could not work ivf uh, success rates in conceiving and having a baby could range between 50 and 60 percent depending on the center wow yeah so it's not 100 percent. no far from well, one of the misconceptions is well we have intercourse and we didn't get pregnant and i tell them you know how the, you're not 100 percent guaranteed pregnancy if you have intercourse on a single month yeah. so the chances could range between 15 20 percent each month so if you wait for six to eight months then you tried enough times to but you have to try on the, the time of ovulation yeah were you ever in a position where can you recall a situation where you were extremely nervous while in the operating room like <laughs> thinking to yourself what do we do now Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I do get nervous in the operating room. I don't show it, though. You I don't. Ha I, I have to keep internalize my, my, my nervousness and anxiety because I'm dealing with a team. A team has to stay calm. If you get nervous, the team gets nervous because you're in the delivery room or for the operating room. They feed off your um, strength. Um, had the nurses... If, you, if you're calm, they are calm and they manage to do their job. If you get, you know, loud and you start throwing things, they get nervous and they can't do their job, honestly. Those doctors exist out there yeah. in the delivery room? Absolutely. Absolutely. God. So your assistant could get nervous um, and, you know, uh, and an assistant gets uh, get nervous because he, he wants to he, he wants to know what's going on. Uh, for, that's why in, in in one of the hospitals I have my own anesthetist and my own assistant. My they come to the delivery room, or this the, the, um, the delivery room and to the um, operating room mm. to uh, to assist me. And uh, you're like playing with a close friend, صح? They know your moves, so you we reciprocate. Uh, and we get we feed off each other and we get the, the job done smoothly because every step they know they've seen me when I'm uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a very difficult situation and they've seen me in easy situations and they know how to assist me in the best way possible. So when did you ask me when or did you ask me do you ever? Can you recall a circumstance? Oh yeah. No, when but one specifically Katir. that pushed your levels of calmness. Katir, when you feel that your patient is uh, in danger, that's when I when I really go, you know, full alert, anxious mode. In Tagult, before, is it like riding a bicycle? And you didn't want to ask that question. I, I did. I, I felt that like I'm kind of like asking the same question again. The question is, is it like riding a bicycle or is each case or patient completely different with regards to the challenges you face? Imagine um, riding a bicycle. When, when I feel... في العياده او في 
في العمليات when I feel that it's it's second nature I stop myself and I say no if if I start thinking that then I might miss something mm-hmm. so no I stop myself from I have to put my whole attention in every single case so I can pick up on small cues and try to you know adjust and and fix and have have a better outcome so every time my patients in day is in danger or the baby's in danger I, i i get nervous internally and anxious and and go into the hyper mode and like you think ahead and you're you're trying to say okay if i do a what's the outcome if i do b if i do c scenario planning exactly and in, in surgery you're trying to mitigate the risks and you're trying to see okay do i ask for blood now or do i wait uh Does it seem like uh, how long do I how long can I bleed until I have to get blood? How, how long? Um, you know, you, you're starting to think and you alhamdulillah, yeah. I've been I've been alhamdulillah fortunate. But um, a curse, this this pre-planning and and thinking ahead is a bit of a curse because your brain goes into uh, hyper mode. That's what it does best. <laughs> it does best, but still. Uh, in, in in not a good way like just the overthinking way. yeah overthinking you're, you're 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 hyper alert and you're um, you're intensely focused in what you're doing and uh, you're trying to just have uh, improve the chances of uh, the patient um, yeah and sometimes patient's life is in danger and you have to act quickly otherwise we lose the patient timing essence times of essence yeah لازم مدك تكون خفيفة you have to be Uh, asking for things before you yani ask for instruments quickly ask for the stuff that you need quickly you prepare your blood you prepare your stuff and um, uh, when you're surrounded by by group uh, a great group of uh, friends and colleagues that you can call on to if you have um, um, if you need help yeah that's great doctor it's it's you guys and pilots who i admire their work to adjust on the fly With what you're saying, I would imagine pilots as well. You know, you need to make decisions sometimes instantly and instinctively because you have 400 people behind you. You know that um, a medical errors, uh, when they tar- started to look into how to prevent errors, they look into medical pi- and into pilots and their systems. So they started putting, um, okay, what what are the most common complications in obstetrics? bleeding okay let's put a checklist for bleeding um they so they put uh, what do you do a b c d e f g h i until you are done like all all the different steps so that's how um medical errors are starting to decrease because you have you have a plan and you have training yourself and your team are trained to try to Uh, look into how to prevent these complications from happening. Yeah. So yeah, pilots are what we looked at to get better. That's great. Moving on. Um, how do you scientifically, and this is actually a question that I'm genuinely interested in, not that my wife experienced it this time as much. I mean, there, there was a little bit, but not to the extent that people do feel postpartum depression. How would you explain it scientifically uh, after women give birth, they feel that they have, they feel depression? Mm-hmm. How does science explain postpartum depression, if you can touch on that? Okay, so especially new moms, um, they have, uh, after giving birth in around day two, day three, uh, they, they have hormonal changes. They have hormonal changes, they have estrogen progesterone tenfold it drops down wow. all of a sudden to normal levels um, that's a huge hormonal shift now then new moms have this new responsibility and uh, uh, looking after a baby and say it's, it's a shock so uh, that's one as another aspect uh, so these changes the the physical changes the the The, the birth trauma, whatever it was, uh, if it was the, the, the pain or the delay or the, the complicated birth or 
um, or having no family around or no caregivers to help her. Uh, these are all factors that could affect uh, a woman and uh, after birth and uh, put them into, in the beginning, they call it uh, postpartum blues. And these could start from day two, day three, and could last for 10 days to two weeks. When the, when the mom is uh, crying for no reason, she's, she's tired, she's, she's feeling tired, more tired than she should be. And uh, she doesn't want to see people. She doesn't want to really, you know, it's not enjoying the moment, enjoying the baby. So we call it postpartum blues. And if it carries on beyond that, uh, it's called postpartum depression. And uh, it's m more severe symptoms than just the blues. And it carries on for a longer time. And um, it could be just, just crying, staying in a room or by herself, doesn't want to breastfeed or just want to look after the baby and um and it's real depression it's almost a sensation of depression it is it? depression it is depression the feeling of worthlessness the feeling of uh loss of joy and loss of hope and uh, uh it's true depression it's wow. not something that a normal person could have it it's not that someone is uh is weak or the, or the weaker person could have it and the stronger person doesn't know it's it's a it's a medical condition is it almost like the withdrawal of hormones because you had it and now yeah the withdrawal of hormones and uh it's is one factor and the, again the the social and the psychological stress that uh, the patients put through um there are people who are more susceptible for it as i said new moms people with depression to begin with uh, people who develop depression before giving birth. Um, some people have uh, family history. Some people have, as I, again, as I said, people who have no support. Uh, these people are all susceptible to have postpartum depression. And some people have to, well, they all have to uh, have some form of um, counseling. And some of them need medications. Yeah. Another thing we take for granted we think that everyone has support when they give birth. Oh. Well, some women are get divorced during pregnancies and family is nowhere near them. Yeah. And it's already difficult for people who have all the support in the world. You know, I Still. can't even imagine what it's like for those who don't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ah. Since working in Saudi, mm -hmm. how far has the medical field advanced? We're not, not to make you feel old or older. <laughs> I'm going to get hit. Older. <laughs> uh, in 23 odd years, how far have you seen the medical field advance in Saudi? Uh, it's, it's huge. Night and day? I, yes, night and day. I left Saudi in 2001, came back 2010. Uh, no, of course, it's, it's a big shift. Um, we came, I came back and I was practicing the same way I was practicing in Canada. Back in in oh one, you know, in well, well, I was in oh between oh one to to ten, I was in Canada. So, I left, I came back, and I started practice, and I didn't feel I left Canada because I had all the the equipment and the support I needed, and it was a huge shift in the medical industry in in Saudi. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about the country finding the people who are unable to uh, separate Siamese twins. And I remember for the longest time, 20, 30 years, I mean, I see it. So it always makes the front page of the paper that uh, the country has funded this family to fly into Saudi to separate Siamese twins. It's been something that Saudi has gotten regional recognition for. Any specific reason why because it's kind of close to your, your field because it's a birth thing. Any particular reason why with Siamese twins, we kind of took, you know, the, the spotlight in, in, in that area? Um, uh, Dr. Rabia was uh, trained uh, as a, he's, a, he's a trained pediatric surgeon. Huh? And uh, he was trained to do these surgeries. Um, I'm guessing, Shuf, I don't know really, but I would imagine if I was trained to do a specific, very difficult procedure and I started to develop a team, of uh, like-minded people, uh, this is a huge endeavor. Tara. You have you t you're talking about um, starting from the surgeon to the assistant to the 
pediatrician to the anesthetist to every every single part of the puzzle he created or he put together in a hospital that provided him the the uh, the the equipment and development the support that he needs uh, yeah we can be the best in any field in medicine of Saudi better than any other country in the world it's, yeah it comes down to resources what's resources um, just thinking big yeah just think big think big think that we could be the best in medicine in the world we have everything we need and just sweet tweaking organization تعال هنا uh, these people تعالوا اشتغلوا مع بعض um, like we, we did in, in a smaller scale in, in the hospital in, in the clinic in a smaller scale we, we brought everyone we need for for taking care of a pregnant woman عارف um, في الرياض مثلا في uh, pediatric or fetal surgery sorry fetal surgery which is doing operations on the fetus inside the womb mm-hmm. هذه ما كانت في الا في في centers a few centers in the world It sounds complicated it's very complicated and the resources you need and everything else uh, so they they go in and they they do some surgery on the baby uh, inside the womb so how does that happen you get someone trained and you get he comes back and he he does he brings together a team and he asks for the resources and the resources are allocated and they do this great job So we can replicate this in every single field. Say, what's the best um, procedure for cardiac, for example? And we, we get everybody we need in the same place. So that's how it works. What areas of the field, you know it better than anyone I know, do you feel that we can perhaps improve on or excel further in? In the field, in our field? In your field. Um, Everyone can get better, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Think big. <laughs> um, honestly, what I just said, uh, I, I, I hope before I retire, you know, Saudi just becomes the go-to uh, country. Saudi in general is the go-to place for medical care not just in the region, in the world. And like, uh, you be proud of, like you said, I'm proud I got good care for Beledi. Um, and man, we can say, oh, we'll go to Germany and we'll do the same thing, or we'll go to America or RAM. Let's have everything here. We have the resources. We have the people. Why couldn't we be the best? And the strong Ministry of Health very strong they flex their muscles in corona oh yeah we we were the no model. one knew by the way that we had a ministry that this strong we look had, how they handled it we had the a model uh model we were the yeah the model country in the world people are saying look at saudi what they did and uh uh we're very proud yeah we can we can be proud of all other aspects of medicine yeah, we just need uh tweaking mm-hmm. It's crazy because everyone had to learn on the go with Corona. You're airborne. You've yeah. got to make decisions quickly and efficiently. Efficiently. And, and you, you better hope that you make the right decisions. Oh, Closing Mecca and Medina, like a, a lot of people were furious about it. But excuse me, that, that will be Mamba, the epicenter of, of the Corona spread. Yeah. Uh, Al-Kaaba and Al-Tawaf is your shoulder to shoulder. Sometimes people are... On top oh, of you. Yeah, that's true. Of course, that's you true. Sh- you shut it down. Yeah. And people were obedient and they listened. And the ratio of populace to, to deaths was, I think we were 98, 99th percentile. Yeah, mashallah. We were, we did, they did very well. And we never had experience in, in, in this. When was the last major pandemic? Ebola wasn't it. SARS wasn't it. No. You'd have to go back to the Spanish flu of 1920 where 50 Something million this people. Big. This big. Yeah. I, I did my research on this. 50 million people died in the Spanish flu. And so, we, uh, I kept working throughout my you work. You kept working throughout? Yeah, was not affected. My patients <laughs> got care. Even in lockdown, you were obviously we able were to. Working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Even, yeah, even uh, throughout. Of course. We, yeah, and uh, it, was, it was something. 
the permits that were issued for those in the medical or food and beverage or to issue permits for those to move around who need to move around was also an amazing uh, an amazing feature by the Ministry of uh, Tijara, Commerce. Personal question. Personal question. We're getting personal now. <laughs> getting personal. <laughs> I have about seven or eight questions left for you, doctor. I know it's... Uh, well, has anyone called needing the... Do- so far, so good? Alhamdulillah. Wow, all right. Yeah, lucky. Mo Show seems to be a lucky studio. Mm. Right, you sure you're not just... Uh, <laughs> 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 Blocking my, my calls. Screening He's my calls. loving the show so much. No one's calling. No one's <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, Ahmed. I'm kidding. You wouldn't do that. <clears throat> um, you're married, doctor. I would mm-hmm. imagine you are. I am. Has... Long hours in uh, in the clinic, especially the early days, has it ever like a- affected uh, family time, etc.? How do you reflect on that? It does, of course, it does. Um, you're you're away a lot, and uh, if you ask me about my first ten years in training, training was about nine ten years. Uh, it was a blur. Training was 19 years? Nine, nine, well, if you count seven years of medical school. Okay. My internship, that's seven. Plus five years 16, of residency. 21. And then two years of fellowship. And you did a master on top. That took a year or so. So. You've studied more than you've practiced. Yeah. Close now, but. I study a lot. So I was married during my my residency and my uh, my fellowship obviously and afterwards so uh nine ten years of training um it was a blur it was mostly at the hospital you're if you don't have a, a strong backbone at home that's uh able to to deal with with kids with with life um then you can't focus on your work and to to do what you do so if you're constantly thinking about home and you can't focus at work, you can't really perform. So it's hard. Yeah, you, you, I missed my own birthdays. I missed um, uh, social functions. I missed Eid uh, with, my, with my family a few times. Um, uh, you know, you don't, when you get called and it's someone that you have followed for nine months, delivered once, twice, three times, four times, sometimes five times, you say, oh, well, uh, you go and you you joke with them. And they joke with you. Like, oh, did we take you out of Salat al-Eid or take you out of Fatur al-Eid or Asha al-Eid? I was like, yeah, I have my whole family back home. I invited my whole family in my own place and uh, I'm here with you. Um, it breaks my heart a bit. Um, that that trumps the most important thing, family. Uh, you see it that way. Uh, yani, it's it's uh, it's my duty. So I, yeah. I I gave you a word yeah. I'll, that I'll be f- there for you when you need me. So if I'm if not if I'm not around, if I'm if I'm physically can't be if I can't come physically, then I can't. If um. Uh, if I gave you my word, I will come. If I didn't give you, you know, if we didn't promise you, if you're not my patient, I I could say, you know what, I'm sorry. I do get calls from non-patients saying, uh, can you come to deliver me my, 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 I, I want you to deliver me and I'm at the hospital and it's like, I'm sorry, I, I'm with Mo now. I'm, I'm going in to, to make a show. <laughs> Lala, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I have a commitment and I can't. And um, yeah, but you do miss, I miss my own birthday this year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it takes a special person to to, to work with such uh, morals, ethics, if you want to call it that. Uh, dedication. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if morals is, a, is, is what it has to do with, for me, you have to do just the right thing. Loss. Yeah. yeah. You be with them. It's it's hard. It's very hard. Mm. It's hard to be called when you just went to sleep an hour ago, and uh, and you have surgery in the morning. It's really hard. It's tough on the body. It's tough on the on the on the brain. And being a light sleeper, you come back and you can't sleep until you start the day. 
your your daily wish is is that sleep <laughs> yeah may may all deliveries be while the sun is up <laughs> yeah and then you go to the office and people look at you like doctor you look upset oh i'm just wow. tired <laughs> why well, you look so grumpy well, i'm not grumpy just tired just tired or i have two things going on at the same time i have a clinic going on and I know that a patient is going to the hospital. So I'm really thinking about that. I'm thinking I'm doing my my pre-planning and my my sorting out and I'm I'm trying to make sure that everything goes smoothly for her and um I'm trying to not disappoint the patients in the clinic that came to see me and booked a while ago and you know yeah. I feel really bad if I have to cancel a clinic or or delay you. Uh, I feel really really bad. because you know how how much they need you. No. You want. No, they you took the time. You drove all the way. Maybe you you called work and you didn't go to work that day or you called in a favor or you you uh you took the day off. And then I end up not coming because I'm so arrogant and uh, I don't want to make it because I'm tired. No. I'll come in. I'll see you and um maybe I'm I'm beat, but I'll come see you. Uh, I hate canceling on patients. Uh, if I'm late, I call and I say, "Look, we am um, Miss Kena, my secretary. She's she has to deal with this. The delivery is going longer than I expected. Um, please call the patients. Uh, let them know that I'm going to be an hour late. So we call an hour before and say, "Look, don't come in at one. Come in at two. Mm-hmm. And I call in a half an hour, an hour later. I'm sorry, I have to. delay another hour so she keeps calling but at least the patients appreciate it is that yeah, it's communication uh, yeah i'm calling you i'm letting you know that we're running behind yeah. um it's not the fault of us because of ours because you know it's a delivery i can't really control it we're just reacting remember yeah we have to so we just keep uh, making everybody aware i think a lot of patients and us as well just seeing you it's like the placebo effect seeing you just extinguishes any anxieties and uncertainties just seeing you yeah. and then we go home or happy sometimes people think i'm i'm a bit too too calm <laughs> but trust me in inside i'm not my brain is just you know it's a superpower you have doctor <laughs> it's a superpower um does he ever uh, have you ever seen him angry yeah, yeah? <laughs> I can't imagine there are a few people in my life I can count on one hand that I can't imagine them angry I've never seen them angry and you, you are on that one hand now I I if no I I do get angry but I don't get angry in when I when I when I raise my voice and you know start doing saying stupid things no uh you can see it from in my eyes you can see it in my looks that I am I'm not happy and uh I don't have to be rude to show that I'm angry no اكثر شيء اللي يشوفوه النيرسز في الـ في العياده وفي كاز ايم ابسست وذ ثينجز جست جوينج ماي واي ذا رايت واي اند اف ايم ان ذا اوبريتنج روم اند ايم هاندد سمثينج ذات اي دونت اسك فور اور اي وونت سمثينج دون ماي واي شي جست جيتس ا لوك اند ذاتس ات اند شي يو نو ذا لوك هي جات هي جات ذا لوك سو ذي جيت ذا لوك ذي نو ذيم انجري بس مها يعني حرام يعني زعق على واحدة مسكينة. she's trying to do her job. Yeah. Uh, my secret my nurses in the in the office know that they have to be sharp. you know, on point. they know. I, I correct you once, I'm not going to correct you again. you come with a speci- you come with a certain level of standards. yeah, that's what that was the reason why we 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 put together this clinic. it's just we wanted things done in a certain way. I I I want to give you a certain level of care. Now, if I can't provide it for you, I I get upset. I I blame myself. I blame that I didn't really, you know, I take it on my, you know, on myself to to give you a good experience as much as I can humanly possible. Great experience. A great experience. Oh, much good. A great experience. I tried to give you a great experience. Yeah. Were you behind the decor? Yeah. Sensed it. It reflects the three of us that picked and uh colors and the scheme and everything and uh yeah I was one of the people who picked the colors yeah very minimal yes that reflects on on my my personality 
So I have a question uh, and I like asking all my guests, but I'm, sp- I'm especially excited to see how you tackle it. And, and it goes, what have you been better at saying no to recently? Oh, that's easy question. Besides patience. No, I, I don't, I say, um, uh, I learned in the last three, four years, you know, not to take on more work than I can handle. So part of it is, you know, doing the clinic in a certain way. I operate, if I, if I can, I operate on one case a day. Hmm. I wouldn't take more, but sometimes I'm forced to take two and I can manage two. Um, the day that I do three, four, five, I'm really tired and I'm beat and I can't do anything the rest of the day. So, um, yeah, I, I do say no to taking on more than I can handle. Can you tell me what the industry standard is for doctors who practice what you do and how many cases they take on a day? Do you have an idea? Is it that five a day? No, no. Mafi, Mafi standard fill in practice, fee standard in training. Uh, you know, uh, but no one tells you you can't operate on you know ten patients a day. محل يقول لك لا. بس أنت تعرف أنت كمان your own يعني يعني physical or mental capabilities. The quantity quality takes a hit. Yeah, but sometimes أنت غصبا عنك يعني you have to ما هي ما sometimes تكون you booked two cases and you get five emergency yeah. cases. So what do you do? تقول لهم no, I'm tired. I'll call you. Uh, 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 no, you, you just have to manage. You do it. Yeah. And uh, for, yeah, I say no to uh, more work than I can handle. And I have been very comfortable now saying no. I say no a lot. How do you combat stress in a job that is clearly <laughs> very stressful? I know you like your cars. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do like my cars. Um yeah, but it's not, cars is not a le- release for stress. Uh, cars is uh, something you enjoy going back and forth 10 times a day for <laughs> delivery. <laughs> At least I go to work when I'm tired. But no, um, dealing with stress, um, yeah, the last four or five years were very stressful. So I uh, started to read more. And uh, what do you read? Oh, I read everything. Fiction and non-fiction. Everything. Self-help. Kafka, le, le, philosophy, le. Away from your field. Not. Oh, no, no, away, totally away, away yeah. from my field. Disconnect. Yes. So you go into uh, things that you want to learn about. You want to read um, certain uh, authors that you heard about. Uh, so uh, reading is very good. I do a lot of audiobooks. I do one a week. Wow. Yeah, sometimes a couple a week and, um, uh, you know, you do 50 plus a, a year. So you learn a lot <laughs> and that helps with, with the stress. So sometimes if I can't quiet my mind at night before going to bed, I, I just put a book on and I start listening. It just quiets you uh, to a certain extent and you can go to sleep. It does. Um, and you learn. So two birds, one stone. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm back at working out. I do work out uh, religiously these days. You took a break. I took a break. You know, you know how it is. So <laughs> you work out for six months, a year, two years, and then you take a few you months. Ha- you have to stop yeah. because you know you just can't do it. Uh, for for now, I'm back, and uh, that is really helping with the stress. Does that affect like when you're you know back in the uh, operation room having had a nice week of a workout under your belt? Do you do you really feel it? The energy? Yeah, you show up aslan after when you work out every day. You show up at work re- feeling refreshed. Um, sometimes you get called in after a workout. You're pumped. Yeah. You go in and you're like, yes, I can do this. Tough to have your day ruined. Um, uh, or did I speak too soon? Yeah, yeah, it's it's sometimes sometimes it's tough. Any Eliom, I couldn't go work out because I had a long day. My day started at seven a.m. Wow! And I and I was go 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 until five ish. So I was like, I couldn't do this. I can't go, come back, and I I had no energy to to give. And so, then go to Mo. 
Uh, no, this is not the hard part. No, it's just my trainer is uh, is, a, is very strict. So yeah, so um, I, 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 it would be nice if I went, but sometimes you just can't do it. But if you're consistent, you can afford to take a day or two off in a week. Yeah, I'd like do I do like six days a week. Yeah, it's incredible. On doctor. Friday, when 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 I don't work out, I swim. I think it's thirty minutes a day to get your heart jacked up. If you can do something that can get your heart jacked up for thirty minutes a day, you're in good shape. Yeah. Plus, it it uh, I was just telling my trainer the other day. I I, I said to him, uh, you know how I used to, like last year if if I had the amount of work I have when I had the amount of work I have usually. Uh, my energy levels were so low at the end of the day, I couldn't I couldn't manage. Now, I can keep going. Like I just, I, I didn't go by choice today, but if I had to go, I would go. Yeah. yeah. When it's part of your routine, you're in a good place. Yeah. And you feel that you need to. Yeah, but that's my number one go-to stress buster. The, the gym. The gym. Yeah. And the books really help. Yeah. The reading helps. It just takes you into a diff- different uh, it does. mindset and you... Uh, and I keep reading about this. Uh, the more you read, the more you learn. Uh, that uh, going and reading fiction and reading, when you take your mind out of your own thoughts and you put them into uh, a character, you, you start starting to think what this character is thinking and what this character is going through, it relieves a lot of your stresses. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, the perspective, I think, it gives you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of audiobooks, and uh, someone once said, uh, l- "Listening to your books is like drinking your vegetables." But <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, that's fine. I think end of the day, the, the nutrition is still going it's into going, your. Uh, no, but في ناس في audio files, صح? Yes. And 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 I can I can take all the information by listening. Um, some people can't. Some people have to to have to read. And some people notes. have to take notes. Some people have to do both. Um, you, all of us have a propensity or a, pref- a preference. And uh, my preference is listening. Yeah. Like I do courses online and I prefer them if they're audio. Audio. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I love a road trips. So I don't know if you've had the pleasure of driving to Al Ula, for example. Uh, but six, seven hours, you know, you're you're finishing a third of an audio book, if not more. Uh, Lincoln Camel. Yeah. yeah. Kitab Camel, yeah. yeah. I love, I love um, like if I could, I would, most of my, actually most of my summer vacations are, are road trips. Mm. So you drive to, uh, you, you fly to one point, you take a car and you go to another point and you fly back. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's what, that would be my perfect holiday. Since you started at 7 a.m., I don't want to keep you here for much longer. I have a few questions and, you know, maybe we sure, can just sure. pop, 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 bullet point through it. Uh, in short, do you think kids today are overschooled in school? Overschooled? Yeah. It was another way of asking my initial question, which I kind of put a line through it. But is there a subject out there that you feel should be mandatory? And at the same time, are child- or kids, school children having too many subjects thrown at them? I really can't talk about that because honestly, I don't know my, what my kids are taking. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what they're taking, honestly. Um, but um, I always thought that uh, our I mean, children should be exposed to different uh, career uh, models. Uh, career day. I'm sure they some schools do have it. But if it's something that's regulated, we have to have one of each مثلا, uh, field per week, per month, throughout the years. And we have to have all the major tasks in the in the career world. Yeah. Um, it will give kids a, a bit of an idea of what and in, in, uh, what I would do, what, what do you do? I am a doctor and I do this and I this is how I spend my day. And uh, these, these are the joys that I experience every day. And uh, yeah, it could be hard sometimes when I have to spend such and such hours, but uh, it's very rewarding. Shukran, ma'asana. 
um, that that opens up girls and boys minds to to see themselves in different you know uh, costumes and uh, <laughs> yeah why not why can't I be an IT engineer why can't I be because I saw this guy once and uh, I liked how he looked and I looked it up and uh, it seems like a cool uh, بس أول أنا تخرجت من الثانوية ما كان في ما كنا نعرف يا دكتور يا مهندس وإذا ما أنت شاطر حتدخل تشتغل في البنك مثلا nothing nothing against bankers صراحة most of my friends are bankers that's 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 how it was that's how it was this was back in the 90s I'm dating myself يعني بس that was a long time ago so if we had role models that would come and say you know what this is what I do and يعني يعطيك options الشيء الثاني ممكن نعمله كمان انه we mandate انه كل المدارس مثلا قبل ما يتخرجوا يسووا اختبار الميول اختبارات الميول is something now that or when my kids were going through high school we had to 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 look for and pay for to for them to do عشان يعرفوا وش يبغوا like your your leanings what are you leaning towards yeah اللي هو affinity tests or uh, so that will tell you if you're better at finance or you're better at science or you're better at you know physics and stuff like that and you go into like architecture or engineering or whatever or uh, coding or عارف يعطيك hint these are the According to your tests, um, these are things that could help you. I'm sure that uh, many of your listeners know more about this than I do. But uh, um, if I, I'm dreaming big, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that some someday that this would be part of a normal, uh, any the 12 years of schooling. Part of it is exposing ch- children to different career opportunities. So. ويختبروهم ويقولوا لهم you can decide not to do it it looks like you're better at finance than than being a doctor it's got to be the way though it's got to be the way be- because what i'm seeing is that at 22 23 they enter the workforce and they're not at a level of being able to contribute because they've been overschooled going back to to the word in the question and it had the word overschooled in it you have so many subjects thrown at you that when you enter the real world, you're a sitting duck. Coding was a great example. Coding, you can contribute to this right now, the age of 22, 23. Mm-hmm. What happens is you're, you're overschooled if you're a normal student, as in not doctor or engineer, um, if you're a business major or if whatever. Um, you enter, you get a job, and what happens is you are not able to contribute until you have a few years of experience under your belt. So then there's a question mark on why can't you contribute with your 22, 23 years of schooling under your belt? Why why is that not enough? Why is that not enough? So it also begs the question is, if you are not gonna contribute at the end of your schooling, why are you going till 22, 23? What is it? Money to go to school, school to get a job, job to pay off the loan you took like it's a yeah yeah it's uh it's it's not i i know people who who didn't pay off their student loans until ma they they were well in their career so how they be it for all the money he is he still wants to make money to retire and in that retirement is you make your own retirement fund and you pay into 401k, it for yeah. 401k you pay into it but then uh, it pays off when you when you retire I wouldn't be sitting here with Damak with Kalamak and achievements or Kida. Yeah. It was on the Beta, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back then, 
ما كان في ترى opportunities. That's uh, sorry just for the audio because it's translated on YouTube but for the audio listeners in Saudi uh, dating back to maybe 05 Malik Abdullah 05 06 yeah. there was this what's the betha in English a sponsor uh, government sponsorship a sponsorship scholarship scholarship of course sorry scholarship that sends uh, students and at one point it was any student who wants to go get an education abroad yeah and the fruits of that investment of the early 2000s have see now today. you see today with yeah. the gentleman sitting in front of me Yeah, yeah. And this was the, the the government bared the cost of that total cost. They paid for myself, my my kids, to to uh, I had an allowance for my wife for my kids, and uh, they paid for the school. So and I lived a comfortable life, um, and I'm very grateful. You know that plan was put in place so by the year 2020 and onwards. You have Saudis who aren't just employees who run their own medical facilities, who are who have patients say, you know what, that felt like UCLA medical. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. Yeah, no, it's no. it's uh, it's it's really surreal. Yeah, and Subhanallah, the vision uh, that uh, and the scholarship. I'm, I'm I think it does. It's still it's still happening today with uh, certain students. There are scholarships. Yes, back when I was going through, if you didn't. If you were not on a, an academic uh, path, scholarships were very scarce. You okay. can't really find one. Uh, I was fortunate to to have be- better grades to, to allow me to go into an academic path and then get the scholarship. Yeah, yeah. So it pays to uh, to pay attention in class and, <laughs> and be one of the smarter ones. <laughs> a human behavior that bothers you the most, doctor? Ignorance. Great. Next question. <laughs> Um, is, is any specific uh, type of ignorance is such a great answer uh, and I'm happy to leave it at that unless you want to elaborate la, la. Yeah. ignorance in general I mean if you if you know that you don't know that's fine But if you don't know that you don't know you're dangerous two more questions something that has changed your life so much recently that you wish you started earlier oh yeah, it's just reading more I wish I started when I was their age you hear uh, that <laughs> how old is Amr? 21 21 mashallah mashallah reading huh reading reading is amazing reading is amazing and uh, we used to be well we are a reading nation but we used to be even a bigger reading nation yeah. uh, I think we should go back more into reading and and a lot of uh, a lot of stuff you get to You experience when you when you have read things, you you can deal with. Yeah, yeah. I every day I I could get across or hear something or do something and something that you read that you know reflects on what what you see in life. So yeah, I wish I read more. I'm trying to catch up now. It was like you you hear from someone else's life and their mistakes and their what they did in scenario A, that when you are faced with that, you won't make the mistake because you have gained the wisdom from the book that you have read. It's funny. I uh, uh, Some of my mentors, I remember back in medical school, uh, he would come into the operating room and say, you know what I read today? And he was saying, I read poetry. It's like, what? I think, I thought you guys read medical books all the time and he was reading poetry and I asked him Doctor Lish Tigrish Gulli you need you need to read stuff like this outside of medicine to to broaden your your knowledge. And uh, I see his point. You have to you have to read because for the first tell like when in high school ila ila now it's been a long journey. And uh, Most of the stuff you read is related to your your specialty and the conferences you go to and you try to keep updated. But you you miss out on stuff like around you. So yeah. um, I'm not talking about popular culture, culture or shit. I'm talking about you know, good reads, uh, good books. And um, you don't want to find yourself at the end of your career or your life and you haven't read. You're just a walking medical dictionary which is useless broaden your horizons broaden your horizons and you're better better companion you're better 
right? متثقف. متثقف. Cultured. Any favorite books? Oh. Malcolm Gladwell, Caldwell. Oh, I read all his books there. Outliers. Outliers is good. Yeah. Uh, it's more of essays. هذاك essays. بيتكلم عن 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 يعني um, he's he's a brilliant writer. Um, I'm finding reading uh, philosophy now is really nice. Philosophy. <laughs> There, I for some reason the people in my life always recommend me books, and when I get a chance, I you know I obviously download on, on audio. Psychology of Money is one that I'm nearing the end of. Oh, that was a good book. Excellent. Obstacles is the way. Uh, I really enjoyed Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Shoe Dog, I want to get into next. The book, the Nike, the, the book about Nike, oh, Phil yeah. Knight. There's Sh- a few, Swoosh and... Uh... Yes. Shoe, where is this Shoe Dog Beef Work? Um, oh God. Yeah, you don't want me to show you my library. <laughs> I know we're bordering on 300 books now. Uh, to close, doctor, um, uh, you thought I wasn't going to ask this question, but I am. Favorite failures or a failure or a perceived failure that perhaps opened the door for something better? Uh, favorite failure. <clears throat> I guess if I go back and say when I didn't go into plastic surgery and found myself into OBGYN I think that was my uh, my best accident because honestly I can't see myself doing anything else plastic surgery was initially your plan yeah wow imagine and now you can't see yourself doing anything no else. no 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 I can't I can't I I think I'm in doing what I I'm meant to do mm. subhanallah I think uh, I hope I'm I'm doing a good job and I, I'm gonna try to improve every time uh, better and better you're very humble you're doing a great job I'm, oh, was I'm a patient <laughs> well, my wife was but like <laughs> truly this this self uh, crit- critique and uh, and daily review is is uh, is also a bad thing but it's a good thing that you and I always tell people that I'm working with like, I We always have to go over what we do every day. Make sure that if we did something right, why do we do it well? And if we did something not wrong, but if we didn't like something we did, how can we make it better? better. Uh, especially in surgery. Like I tell my assistant, this is this is a constant thing for me. And I leave the operating room. I, I keep thinking about how I did it and why did it look so good? Why did it... Uh, And uh, if I didn't like it, and I'm a very harsh critic of myself, I'm, I'm you know, my worst enemy when it comes to self-critique. Uh, I, I, I keep thinking, how can I improve? And um, it's a blessing and uh, it's a curse. It's Are you hard on yourself? I'm very hard. Very on hard on yourself. Extremely hard on myself. Are you also kind to yourself? I need to learn how to be kind to myself. Uh, I, I'm, I'm working on that. It's not an easy thing. It's it's easier to to be hard on yourself than to, to be kind to that's yourself. True. Wonder why that is, but yeah, that's true. Uh, last one: uh, movies that are medical related or shows like ER or whatever. Do you find yourself watching them or just like uh, laughing? That'll never happen. <laughs> um, well, it's they're not OBGYN mainly. They're mo- mainly emergency room. Yeah, surgery. Uh, sometimes they they get the the, the occasional uh, pregnant woman. Um, they're fun to watch, fun to watch, but it could it could um, it could be stressful sometimes because they put you in the same situation that you were in last year, last mm. month, yesterday. So I, I watch, yeah, open, yeah, yeah. and uh, it, you you sent you see it, it could could be um, could be a trigger for you sometimes. Trigger, yeah. So well, I watch them. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the I enjoy them when they don't get too tedious, like. Grey's Anatomy is like at its what twenty something season, like I can't do that. It's too much. I like to watch TV, but give me something I can enjoy and learn from. Yeah, 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 I get it. Thank you so much for giving me what I feel was two hours of your time. No, no, I, it, time went by so fast. It, it did, it did. Uh, this was a really interesting and beneficial episode. 
I I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. And and I trust those, you know, females and and males who watch this will will leave with something of value. I hope so. And uh, thank you again, doctor, for the time you gave me. I totally appreciate it, and I I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.